Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. On today's show, Kyle Bauer visits with Rich Llewellyn to discuss the Risk and Profit Conference. Then enjoy this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Next, Dwayne Taves and Mark Gardner talk about the history of Gardner Angus Ranch and their business decisions. Then it's this week's Kansas Farm Bureau Update and we'll end with Plain Talk. Don't go away. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome to Farm Factor. Up first today, Kyle Bauer visits with Rich Llewellyn to discuss the benefits of the Risk and Profit Conference. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer. I have Rich Llewellyn uh, with me. We're at the uh, Risk and Profit Conference that Kansas State Ag Economics puts on each year. Uh, Rich, you've been involved a long time, and this conference has been going on for a long time. I have. It's been about 12 years I've been involved with it. It's been going on for 23 years. It started in 1996. So. So um, there's a wide variety of projects here or, pro- or presentations. In fact, I sat at a table that had livestock people and it had grad students with it. It's a huge variety of presentations. It is. Uh, we have the main session with the trade, but then uh, a lot of the breakout sessions depend on the uh, uh, professors who are uh, presenting and what they have going on in their current research program. So we try for applied topics that will uh, uh be something useful to folks here and it's also useful for the faculty in allowing them to interact with uh, producers with lenders and find out what's going on out in the country too. Kansas State's Ag Econ Department uh, is big I mean some of it is extension some of its teaching some of its research it appears to me that you're involving all of those folks in this. We are and that's one of the things we have other extension conferences throughout the year Uh, But this is one where we bring our teaching and research faculty also into the uh, program and allow them to present uh, their current research, uh, some of which they have uh, been doing for the last year. And uh, it also allows some graduate students who have some work going on to uh, come and present the things they've been doing. It appears to me it also reaches across to different departments. It does uh, somewhat. Uh, We have quite a bit of livestock this year, uh, and so our livestock economists work quite a bit with uh, animal science professors and and, uh, researchers uh, looking at different topics. uh, uh, But we also have uh, ag econ topics that are specific to it, like marketing, uh, hedging, things like that. Um, We have also quite a bit of crops. It's a crops emphasis on the conference. And so uh, economics of crop production, which involves a lot of agronomists as well. You have breakout sessions so people can pretty much tailor it to what they want, but your general sessions are really um, pretty cutting edge for the whole nation. And we try to do that each year, especially with the introduction section uh, session like today. Uh, we had a trade uh, session with a uh, former trade negotiator, and so... Um, what we like to have is something like that that's a, a hot current topic. And then uh, we have the other sessions going on, too. On Tomorrow, we'll also have the uh, grain outlook and the livestock outlook, so covering both the grain markets and the, the livestock markets from a market side of things and, and what's going on and what's expected to maybe go on. Now, is this conference always in August every year? It is. Uh, we shoot for the first week uh, here before classes start at K-State, so parking's a little better. But, uh, yeah, it's a good time. A lot of folks have their uh, uh, late summer work done, uh, they're back from vacations, so it works pretty well. Visiting with Rich Llewellyn, we are at the uh, Risk and Profit Conference at Kansas State University, put on by the Kansas State Ag Economics Department. This is Kyle Bauer reporting. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Kyle. Folks, come back after these messages for this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business was started in the 80s. 
we predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but yet we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at surecropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'd be glad to answer and work with you. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment is brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Aaron Murray is a middle school teacher in the Shawnee Mission School District who joins us. And Aaron, you've also participated in the Kansas Soybeans as a Food Facts Program. What is the purpose of the Kansas Soybeans as a Food Facts Program? I believe it's an opportunity for us as facts teachers to be provided with soy products and teach our students about the benefits of using soy, the versatility of soy, and how we can incorporate it into our diet. What got you interested in participating in the program? As most schools are, we're very limited. We have a food budget, but it's always tight, and the Soy Council is very generous in helping us offset some of our expenses if we're willing to participate and use some of our soy products. How did you incorporate this into your lesson plans for the students? We had an opportunity to use soy products. We were able to substitute products that we would often buy, like regular milk, and we'd substitute it with soy milk. And we would use tofu. Oftentimes, one of my students' favorite things to make was a tofu manicotti. And we just learned to substitute a lot of the other foods for soy products. Soy products are chameleon food. They absorb any of the flavors that one might incorporate in with baking or cooking. We also talked a lot about the health benefits of using soy. It's high in protein, it's healthy, and that's a portion of how we've used it. The deadline for the fall facts program is coming up very soon. If there are any facts teachers that are listening, the deadline is September 21st, and it's just as simple as filling out a request with the council, letting them know how many students you have, and then you keep the receipts, and then the Soy Council will reimburse you at the end of the semester. And they're really quite very generous in the products that they will reimburse you for. Why is it important to teach students at this particular age the importance of food like soybeans? I think a lot of the choices that they make early in life to just stay with them for the rest of their life. And I just feel it's imperative, really, that we teach and demonstrate good health choices for young people. Because as I often say to my students, you put junk in your body, you're going to have a junky body. Maybe not right now, but certainly down the line. We know so much that there's a connection between what we eat and our health. That is Aaron Murray, who is a middle school teacher in the Shawnee Mission School District, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's Brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. Hope you enjoyed this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Stay with us after the break for more as Dwayne Taves and Mark Gardner talk about the history of business practices at Gardner Angus Ranch. What if sustainability were synonymous with U.S. soy? If energy efficiency, water quality, and soil health help define U.S. soy's value, that future is here, the time is now. To meet end-user demands, the Soybean Checkoff is committing to sustainability that's achievable, worthwhile, and enduring. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. 
All over the country, more and more communities are making the change to biodiesel, made from U.S. soybean oil. And the decision continues improving the health and welfare for millions of Americans while adding billions to our national economy. Kim Mandarin with Hardy Insurance. I'm here to help you with all of your farm and ranch needs. When it comes to protecting your operation and your family, you need a name you can trust at a price you can afford. Call me today or visit hardyaviationins.com. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We're back. Now we learn more about the Gardner Angus Ranch with Dwayne Taves and Mark Gardner. Dwayne Thames joining you once again on Ag AM in Kansas and an opportunity to catch up with Mark Gardner, Gardner Angus Ranch. And Mark, we're talking about uh, surviving and thriving in the beef business. Uh, you recently talked to some producers about things that the Gardner Ranch has been involved in. Talk a little bit about uh, how that perception and, and forward-looking uh, opportunity came about that, uh, that you decided that we're going to start to take part of our own destiny. Well, I think when you look at all the opportunities that we have in agriculture, um, in the old days, they might have called it neighboring and they might call it networking today or they might just call it uh, a bull session. But I think when you invest in yourself and you invest in the opportunities that are available, and that means becoming educated about those. And so we talked a little bit about the startup company of U.S. Premium Beef that was started in 1997. And... Uh, that was an idea at the time that was a lot of people were against it and they said you could not do it but we felt there was a need uh, to make an investment and put skin in the game and uh, there were 450 some producers stockholders that ultimately invested uh, to having further processing and, and bought a part of national beef and uh, we were probably too young and dumb at that time to know we couldn't do that but because of good people, hard work, good information, uh, it's a company and a system that has added a lot of value to my family's business, to my customers' business, but quite frankly, you know, Dwayne, to the entire beef industry. And so when we can add value to the business of beef, that's good for everybody. You talk about having uh, the foresight to be involved in something like that. Understanding and having a knowledge of what your kettle were able to do and perform was pretty important to, to take that step, I assume. Absolutely. You know, if we can measure it, we can manage it. And I, you know, often it's simple and, and often said, but knowledge is power. And so when you know what these cattle can do, I actually think back to the beginning of U.S. Premium Beef. And as a kid and, and all through my life, we went in and got carcass data. And I remember a lot of the stockholders in, in those days just think that all cattle were thought of as the same and they're all great. They're, they're wonderful because they were born on my land. And, and I remember telling my friend and our CEO, Steve Hunt, I said, you know, if we're lucky, the U.S. premium beef cattle will be average at best because they haven't been selected uh, for the end product merit traits that, that we're going to pay our grid on. And he knew that and I knew that and a lot of the industry had to learn that. For my own family, when we had been getting carcass data since 1970, we knew there were differences. There were huge differences and we measured those differences. So when, when other customers and other stockholders and beef producers had that same opportunity to see those differences, Cattlemen are not stupid. And so when they saw those results, they made the changes both in manages, management and also in genetics uh, to become more profitable. So knowledge truly is power. And when they measured that, when they saw those differences, they made the changes they needed to make, Dwayne, to become more profitable. Your operation, obviously, you give a lot of credit to your father and making that decision a long time ago uh, to make that kind of genetic selection and advancement. You know, at, we're at Kansas State today, and Dad learned how to AI in the 1950s, and it became proficient enough. And it was a new technology in the 1950s there. It was kind of radical. Uh, but in 1964, he made the decision to, to be total AI without the use of any cleanup bulls. And we've maintained that to this date. But if we look at our information and we look at all the the what we had learned from 1964 to 1980 dad knew that he hadn't made any progress our calves had the same weaning weight then as they did in 1980 and but he was a beef advocate a beef enthusiast and he's like we ought to be able to make change in the beef business but dang it why haven't we been able to and we 
He'd look at the dairy industry and see the improvements they made. Well, when we look back to the fall of 1980, that was the very first sire summaries that were run for most breeds and certainly for American Angus Association. We got the same tools that the dairy industry had, and that was the best linear unbiased prediction, the BLUP procedure. I remember coming home for Thanksgiving in the fall of 1980, and Henry said, I finally know what we're going to do. I said, great. What are we going to do? We're only going to use high-accuracy, progeny-proven bulls for the traits of merit. I said, well, how are you going to know what those are? Well, here they are. They're in the sire summary. This is what we're going to do. I said, well, how do you know that's right? He said, I took all the bulls I used from 1964 to 1980, and I averaged them up, and their EPDs told them if we use them in a total AI situation, we would make no change on anything, birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, any weight. I mean, and we had made absolutely no change. This will work, he said. And I said, well, great. And since that time, the reality of, of our family and many other families' ranches, because of database selection, uh, we were able to go from a break-even to a loss business to to be able to grow our business where today it supports my, my two brothers and, and uh, um, basically 10 different families. And so we grew the business, but it was as simple as we had measured it. We knew we needed to improve. We got the knowledge and the information to make those improvements. When we did that, we grew our business and helped other families do the same. Our thanks to Mark Gardner joining us on Ag AM in Kansas. Jamie, we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Dwayne. Come back after the break for this week's Kansas Farm Bureau update. I had this horse, it was a good horse, except when the wind was blowing above 30 mile an hour. Wind was blowing about 35, 40, and I saddled him up, rode him out to the end of the lane, and I thought, well, he's doing pretty good. And about six jumps later, I was laying on the ground and thinking, boy, my shoulders sure hurt. I kept waiting and it, it didn't get better. And so I went to an orthopedic surgeon and that showed that I had torn rotator cuff. And said, well, I have to do surgery. And I, I farm and ranch by myself. It's not gonna work out very well. I'd been sleeping in my recliner for about two and a half years because it hurt too much to sleep in bed on my side. And I'd heard about Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center on the radio. And gotten down there at eight o'clock in the morning and by 11.30, the procedure was all over. They just took some fat out of my side here and spun that down for about 45 minutes and then injected it in my shoulders and I was on my way. It's something you don't hear about but I thought it was worth a try and, and I'm really pleased. It's, it's really worked out well for me. KFRM is one of the largest farm radio stations in the nation dedicated to informing and entertaining rural listeners from northern Oklahoma to southwestern Nebraska. You can catch KFRM in many ways. Of course, 550 on the AM dial, streaming at kfrm.com or on your smartphone by going to the TuneIn Radio app or on Ag AM in Kansas on Tuesdays and Facebook every day of the week. KFRM, tune us in. You'll be glad you did. Kim Mandarin with Hardy Insurance. I'm here to help you with all of your farm and ranch needs. When it comes to protecting your operation and your family, you need a name you can trust at a price you can afford. Call me today or visit hardyaviationins.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Farm Bureau Update. Uh, I'm Keith Miller. I'm from Great Bend, Kansas. I farm and ranch there. I uh, have the opportunity to serve on the county and state committees, and now I'm on the board of directors for Kansas Farm Bureau. I enjoy working with people and trying to make a difference in their lives in agriculture, and that is the reason why I do what I do. Trade is one of the most important things that uh, affects us in agriculture right now. A lot of our income is coming from trade, and we need to be very watchful on what happens with trade. A lot of people are concerned. I'm deeply concerned. But the things that President Trump has started is causing some ruckus, and there's no question about that. But he is trying to get us a better deal. We have been riding on the shirt tails of a lot of countries. And uh, it's, it's going to disrupt trade for a short term. But Hopefully, long term, we have a lot better trade deals 
uh, especially in the Asian countries where we were being taken advantage of. Uh, tariffs, we hope, will fall. Uh, currently, some of those tariffs are uh, I uh, know on one commodity in one country, it's 700% tariff, and we need to break those tariffs down, and that's what President Trump's trying to do with these trade wars. Stay with us. We'll be back after the break with Plain Talk. Summer is busy at Tarwater Farm and Home. We have just about everything you'll need for your summer projects, and we're consistently competitively priced. Tarwaters can help make your grass and garden grow. And we have a huge variety of equipment to cut it. If you have a farm, Tarwaters has the products and equipment to keep it going strong. And our expanded parking lot will make it even more convenient to shop. So come see us at Tarwater Farm and Home in Topeka. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. Welcome back. Now let's see what Kyle and Dwayne are up to on Plain Talk. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Plain Talk with Dwayne, Dwayne, I tell you, Taves. Kyle Bauer, your fact or fiction question of the day. The longest musical performance is currently ongoing, started in the year 2001, and isn't set to expire until the year 2640. Fact or fiction. It's a live musical you're talking about. Live performance. 2,630. 2,640. 40. They got a contract for that long. Absolutely. Started in 2001. Now I want to tell you, Dwayne Taves, anybody yeah. that'll give you a contract that long, Take you it. no, you well, have got to worry, have to worry about, about the, if the guy knows anything at all and it's who like is so. Six generations of people got to worry well, about Well, more than that, that a generation was. isn't a hundred years, well, sunshine, not if you live like you and I do. Yeah. Oh, you know, that's so stupid. I'll say it's true. It is true. And the fact, uh, the last time a note changed in the music was in October of 2013. Well, what is it? Playing the same. What note. is it? Does it say? It's John Cage's organ, and it's known as uh, "Slow as as Slow as Possible," is the title of the musical program. It's in actually taking place at Saint Bernardi in Halberstadt, Germany. We went Something to see. You, you you probably didn't go see that. No, I, I no, I did not, and it's not on my bucket list. Wow. Um, though. Um, Organ music is is good. Um, I th I prefer some more than others, but a an acquaintance I will say, all right, um, is really a big fan of accordion music. Oh, and right. it's like really, it's like okay. I mean, I'm trying to to well. When I went to Italy, yes. I. I, there's a lot of accordion players there. I mean, like every little band. So and, did you get you a CD to bring back? Well, I don't think so. No. Uh, but it turns out I've come to appreciate accordion players a lot more because right. I paid more attention. Right. You know, and there's more and there was literally to it than most think. And and it's pleasant. And uh, we had all the way from them playing on the street. You know how you'll have street sure. musicians, yeah. people just playing an accordion on the street. You don't see yeah, that in the United States. Cup there. He did. Pitch him a Absolutely. Well, they're usually a box or a hat. Yeah. And um, and then we're on a train, and uh, it's a local train that stops maybe every 10 miles, something like that. And some guys got on the car we were in, and all of a sudden I'm hearing music and saying, that's pretty good. And turn around, it's live music back they're there. The Guy train. with a saxophone and an accordion. Now, this isn't the type that's just the squeeze box. Okay. This is the type that has the the keyboard down the side. Uh, that's an accordion, right? That's what they all play is the type with the, with the, the keyboard. No, 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 not okay. strings. It's keyboard. I mean, it looks like a piano keyboard on this side, and they push it in and out. Okay. That's, I mean, I that's the type they play different. there, and I think we you still call that. when I was a kid that had a keyboard on the side, but it had strings going across like a harp. Oh, Hmm. I don't remember what they called that. I don't know, but then no, this Here's didn't have strings. I bet you don't know. Oh, no, I bet, I bet I do. I, I know everything, do I? Huge, I am a huge fan of bagpipe music, and it drives my family nuts. And I've made them promise to play it at my funeral. Okay. Here's the thing is, you know why generally when they play the bad bagpipes, they're marching. Why? To get away from the sound. 
Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. Closed captioning brought to you by Egg Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at eggpromosource.com.